So I'm really excited about the next session. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, the world's largest crowdfunding site is Indiegogo. And the co-founder of that company, I know, it's so exciting, is here to give a case study with us today. We actually met Danae um, way back when, when we were just doing uh, Women 2.0 for fun. Uh, and she had just come up with the idea of Indiegogo. And she was at one of these events called, uh, what we had at the time was an angel round table in Palo Alto. And she walked in and she's like, I'm doing this thing that helps fund independent films. And I was like, OK, that's cool. Um, I love independent films. So I, I was pretty fascinated by the idea. But I remember going home and going thinking, wow, how is she going to make a business out of that? Like I just couldn't, I personally couldn't make sense of it. I thought uh, Danae was great. She's had, she has a bunch of mutual friends with me. So I've always sort of kept in tabs with her. But I guess that's also because of Facebook. Um, but yeah, it really, it really struck me. I thought, wow, this is a really interesting idea, a really passionate person. I'm just, I'm curious to see how this is going to pan out. And what's exciting is it's now the large, world's largest crowdfunding site, funding not just independent films, but all sorts of amazing products, projects, things, which she will tell you about. And I'm just really proud of her for sticking with the idea all the way through, because I know in the beginning it was hard. I know people didn't really understand what she was doing. Um, and, and didn't know how it was going to pan out. And now I feel like they've redefined an entire industry, um, which is exciting. So what's cool is we get to hear the story. Uh, so about a little bit more about Danae. So before Indiegogo, Danae was actually a securities analyst at Cohen & Co, uh, where she covered entertainment companies including Pixar, Lionsgate, Disney, and Electronic Arts. She also focused on cable network, uh, NFL, newspaper, and hedge fund clientele while at J.P. Morgan's Investment Bank and Private Bank. She is a CFA charter, hol charter holder and holds an MBA from the Haas School of Business, which is where she met her co-founders, correct? So exciting. So with that, I'd like to bring the lovely Danae to the stage. Oh, I get a hug, hug, yes. It's Valentine's Day. Let's I know, love. I could use some love, man. <laughs> All right, um, I am pumped to be here. Um, woo, yes. Um, notice I'm trying to wear red in support of love and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. To me, that means sharing and open and supporting each other. Um, all right, well, I'm actually kind of not going to talk about Indiegogo um, explicitly. I love to talk about Indiegogo, so I'm, it'll come up a lot for sure. But really what I'm going to do is going to talk a little bit behind the scenes um, of Indiegogo. And uh, what we're going to talk about is culture, uh, something very, very near and dear to my heart, um, something that I continue to focus on today, and um, something that I think, whoops, there we go. Um, some people, sometimes culture, it's this word, it's, it's no one quite knows what it means. Some people call it fluffy, uh, soft. Uh, which, it, which means not, not very important. And I actually would beg to argue differently. I actually think uh, culture is the opposite of soft. It's actually incredibly hard. And because it's incredibly hard, it's that much more important to really get right um, and to continue to, to, to figure out. So I'm going to talk about culture. I'm going to talk about how Indiegogo's kind of approach culture. And hopefully my goal today is for you guys to get a better understanding of what culture means to you and how you can take that back to your businesses. Just a show of hands, how many people are entrepreneurs? Yes, awesome. How many people have more than uh, 20 people at their company? More than 10? More than five? Less than three? All right, yes, perfect time to be talking about culture. Okay, um, but to, to set, kind of to set the framework, I'm not gonna talk about any I'm gonna talk, talk about these, um, uh, what I, call, what I call people precursor species, <laughs> the Cro-Magnums and the Neanderthals. I don't, this is not going to be a, a very good history lesson, but um, hopefully it'll shed some insight. So actually, many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands of years ago, there are these two species called the Cro-Magnums and the Neanderthals. And the Cro-Magnums were interesting because um, what, they, what they did is they did a lot of different things. They're actually very creative, very social beings. Um, unlike the Neanderthals, which weren't. So cr the crow magnums, for example, um, did, uh, when they would catch a fish, they would bring it home to their friends and family and share it. And when the Neanderthals did, they would just eat it there on the spot. 
um, when the Cro-Magnums wanted uh, to um, impart knowledge with each other and share knowledge, they'd actually, they developed a system of, of painting pictures on a wall, and the Neanderthals didn't. Um, what was important to the Cro-Magnums was, again, sharing and being social and, and knowledge transfer, and it just wasn't that important to the Neanderthals. So guess which species survived, and guess which species didn't? The Cro-Magnums, clearly. Um, so wh what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is what the Cro-Magnums did is they developed a system of, of values and beliefs and behaviors that actually enabled them to survive. And it's because the Neanderthals didn't do that that they didn't survive. So what I'm saying is because of culture, which is, in my opinion, a system of values, beliefs, and behaviors, it's, what, it's that culture that enabled this whole species to survive and turn into what has become homo sapiens, all of us. Um, and it's the Neanderthals that didn't. So culture is not just um, a fluffy word. It's basically our means for survival. So that's why it's important. Um, and culture is everywhere, but it's not always the same. So here at the society level in America, independence is something quite valued. And we believe it so much so that we um, completely admire individual achievements, so much so that we create magazines to honor individuals who are doing uh, crazy cool stuff. Um, but it's not always that. It can be very different, like, uh, like Bhutan, who we all know they've developed the gross national happiness. Well, that's a measure of happiness because they believe and they value that happiness and well-being is a really important uh, measure of progress. And then we have culture at the industry level. We have finance, which is you know, all about being serious in suits. Um, and then the startup world, which is the exact opposite. Um, then you have the music world, which is you kind of show up at any time for a meeting whenever you want. And then you've got the manufacturing world, which is if you're not there, you're done. So it, not that anything is wrong or right. Every industry is conforming to something different, but they're conform conforming to a culture. And that culture is what's enabling them to, to exist. Um, it happens at the company level, too, which is what we're going to get into today. So, um, for example, here at Amazon, they view the world um, in a way that um, it's finite. So they're in a competitive landscape. Competition is really important. Gaining market share is very important. If they win, others lose, and that means they survive. And so given that, they have a culture that's incredibly internally competitive. It matches what what their whole environment is. So for example, the average turnover, so I've been told, is 18 months. What they do is they pit two people against each other and compete it out, and whoever gets the best results gets moved on, the other one gets worked out. And that's not bad or good, it's just the way it is, and it, it allows them to sustain their culture. But what's different is Indiegogo is very different from that. Um, competition is less important. What's more important for us is innovation, because we're creating a whole new industry called crowdfunding, as Shaharo says. This word crowdfunding didn't exist when we started. <laughs> We just knew that the internet was going to be this amazing place for people to connect with others and fund what mattered to them. And then that would actually decentralize finance and make finance far more fair and efficient. But that was a big idea, and uh, we needed to go prove it. So we needed to actually uh, have an environment that would constantly uh, reward innovation. And so an example of that is Kate Zimmerman. She's our seventh employee out of 85. She's still with Indiegogo today. In the last three years, she's had four different jobs. Um, all because she keeps coming to the plate, creating, creating new, um, new ideas and executing against them and innovating. She started as our director of happiness, crushed it, totally figured out what that meant for the industry. Then she got promoted, became our director of payments, completely crushed payments. Because again, in this role, there's no like template to follow. She was literally creating the industry standard for payments within, within crowdfunding. She crushed that. So now she's the director of insights. And she just got promoted to director of strategic planning. So who knows what she's going go, to go do next. But the difference is, is because we, we value innovation, um, uh, we, we've created a culture uh, that rewards that. So one thing to realize is that I fully believe there's no such thing as a good culture and a bad culture. I think that's a false choice. But what duality does exist is a culture that's really strongly aligned with the values, beliefs, and behaviors that that company needs to, to, to do to thrive and exist. And there's weak cultures, which is where the people are not fully aligned. So the question is, um, I'm pulling this slide actually from um, an, an awesome deck called How to Build an Awesome Culture, written by an awesome guy named David Cashin, who I think is here in the audience. Raise your hand. Dave? 
he's coming. OK, I can't see him. Um, who also writes a blog called How to Be, uh, the Awesome Culture Blog. So I highly recommend it, because he's actually helping us to this day. Um, but really what he recognizes is that we all uh, want to go in different directions, and it's the job of the company and the job of you and as the leaders of a company setting culture to get everybody in alignment. Um, so how do you create a strong culture where everyone's in alignment? Well, first of all, you don't do this. So what's this? <laughs> this uh, came from literally a conversation I was having with um, a bunch of other entrepreneurs. Um, they all happen to be male. I'm not saying anything because of that. It, it just was the, was the truth. And uh, we were at a dinner with our investors, and one of them said, uh, the topic of culture came up. And one of them said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I have to do that. I keep, I keep not doing that. I keep, it keeps being my you know, 11th on my top 10 list. Like, I just never get to it. And to which I completely chimed in and cut him off and said, oh, you're doing culture. You're just doing it unconsciously. Because every time you respond to an email, tell somebody good job or not good job, every time you set your strategic priorities whether you, and involve people or you don't involve people, um, every action you take is setting culture. Because that's what you're telling your people is what is important. And the problem is you have no idea if the values, behaviors, um, and beliefs that you're exhibiting every day are actually the ones your company needs to succeed. And so you're kind of setting yourself up for potentially a catastrophe. So um, I would say don't do that. Instead, being, the answer here is you just have to be incredibly intentional about it. You have to be intentional. You have to first recognize what are the values, beliefs, and behaviors that are actually needed for your company to succeed. And then it's a matter of going and finding those people that, um, that actually exhibit those in a natural way. So I'm going to tell you how we did it. And first off, I say it sounds like I kind of had this all figured out uh, when we started the process of creating culture, and that is a complete fallacy. That is not. Um, I actually, uh, we bumped into this, um, how should I say it? We bumped into the need to figure out culture back when we were about four, three or four people. Um, and it was only when we raised our first round of capital, which, um, Here's a funny story. So we started January 2008. Our whole plan was to launch and get some case studies and raise a bunch of venture capital in the fall of 2008. Clearly, that didn't happen. That's probably when I met Shah Haros. And she's like, ooh, I don't know if you guys are going to make it. Um, but we just stuck through it. And um, somehow, we made it through. And we finally raised that first round of capital in March 2011. So three years later, um, we made it happen. But when we raised it, that's when I realized, oh my god, we need to know who we are because we have to go hire people. And how the hell are we going to know who to hire? Um, and so that's when we kind of bumped into the need for culture. And um, a completely side note is, and this is kind of embarrassing, um, I, for whatever reason, I have this thing where I only trust guys with beards. Um, <laughs> it's true. Like, all the men in my family have beards. I worked in finance for seven years. No men in the business there were allowed to have beards. I clearly left finance to change finance, so I clearly had a distrust of men with beards. It's totally irrational. I can't explain it. It just is what it is. So all I want to say is thank God my two co-founders had beards, because if they didn't, I might have not trusted them. I might have never started any go-go, which is just speaks to how powerful beliefs are even as irrational as they might be. So anyways, um, so thank God they had beards. Um, but thank God that we, we sat ourselves down. And we put ourselves through an exercise to kind of say, well, who are we? What, what, are, the, what are the values that we hold? Um, and you might ask, like, you know, how, you know, what's the process to do it? And I would say, especially since we have so many early entrepreneurs here, is, is actually it's, the benefit is um, you don't have to go outside and like, find your values out there in the world. Uh, the benefit of being an entrepreneur is the values, the beliefs, and behaviors that your company needs to, to succeed are the ones that you hold yourself. Because you started this company for a reason. You're trying to solve a problem. And so the goal, your goals, are your company's goals. It's one and the same. So really, it's not a finding exercise. It's an uncovering discovery exercise. Um, so that's what we did. So I had a little fun with this um, because um, we got to draw. And thank God, drawing is not a critical success factor to starting a business, because we were all really bad at it. But um, what I made us do, and this is an exercise we did, I encourage you guys to think about it, it might be right for you guys, is you know, when we had to answer the question like, you know, what do we value? Why are we here? 
Um, I made us all sit down and in five minutes draw pictures answering that question. I created a, a, a page where everyone had to um, right at the top of the page, I work at Indiegogo because fill in the blank. And we had five minutes to, f to draw six pictures. And after we all did that, we all kind of went around the group like show and tell, it was really cute. Um, and we talked about our pictures and what it was that drove us to work at Indiegogo every single day. And this is, again, it's back when we were five people. So we had just hired um, our first two people, Erica and Adam, who are still with us today. Um, and over the course of that conversation, we kind of slough, sloughed out this like, um, these themes, these sentences about why we all came to work together. And um, I, I, I aggregated them all, I kind of synthesized it, and what became clear is um, these themes uh, actually bucketed down into four specific ideas. And I wasn't expecting this, it was actually kind of funny because we're very action-oriented, one of our kind of values is like always know exactly what you're trying to do when you're trying to do it. Um, and what the result is you're trying to go for. And um, Slava is incredibly like that. I've actually, I think, learned that from him. And when we were doing this exercise, he's like, what's our goal here? I'm like, I don't quite know. Um, and it was actually really hard because I wasn't sure what the output was going to be. I just knew it was important that we did this exercise. And um, thank God we did because it's become the foundation for pretty much everything. Um, so in the process, what became clear is that all of us came to work um, because we all wanted to change an industry. We weren't afraid of the fact that finance had existed in the way it existed for you know, dozens, if not hundreds of years, where there's gatekeepers, where people decide which ideas come to life and which ideas don't, um, where all that wealth is concentrated in a couple decision makers. We loved the fact that we could blow that up. And so we got excited about doing that and trumping the status quo. And so fearlessness was a word that kind of fell out of that that all brought us together. Another reason we all came to work every day was because we wanted to bring our whole selves to work. Maybe this was a reaction of me working in finance for seven years, where I literally felt like I had to put on a physical suit and a mental suit to be the person they wanted me to be. But I wanted to come to work because I wanted to be whoever I was. I didn't want to have to change that. And all of my colleagues um, agreed. Um, authenticity was the word that kind of came out of that. And then another reason we all wanted to come to work every day was because we actually wanted to work with other people who were smarter than us. And we wanted to share our learnings. And we actually wanted to build something bigger and greater than all of us could do individually. Um, no one wanted to be solo acts. We all wanted to literally you know, create something where 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 100. Uh, so collaboration became a key, a key value for us. And then the last was uh, we all came to work because we really wanted to help people that wanted to be helped. We wanted, you know, you come to work and you spend 70% of your waking life there. And we wanted to make sure that the hours on this planet were being put towards something we all believed in, which is helping people. And so empowerment uh, became kind of the fourth reason all of us came to work. So what happened is we actually came up with four values without even realizing we were doing it. Fearlessness, authenticity, collaboration, and empowerment. And this was like four years ago now. And those values have stuck. Uh, we call them face. Um, and we call all of the people at Indiegogo the faces of Indiegogo because they bring all this to work. So what we did at that point is we started using face right away in our hiring. We created whole systems, questionnaires, where we would test for skill set, knowledge, and all that important stuff, motivation. Um, but then we, we, we tested for the personal characteristics. Do people exhibit fearlessness, authenticity, collaboration, empowerment? And it wasn't like, are you fearless? <laughs> do you empower people? Don't do that. Um, and it actually, we've iterated a lot on this, and we're actually going to continue to iterate on it because as we've grown as an organization, you know, every time a new person adds, you, you change your whole organization. And so fearlessness might has, has taken on a couple different definitions. So, um, but with that, though, it really helped us hone in. I think we even got to like 40 or 45 people, and at that point, it had only lost like one or two people at that point. So our turnover was like minuscule. Our investors, their jaws were dropped. They, they were like shocked about that because in a high growth startup, you know you're going to get have more mistakes. So um, it really started to pay off uh, right away. Um, but then we started realizing that face uh, had more value than, uh, than that. Um, we uh, started uh, doing things called all hands. So every quarter we bring our whole company together so that they could actually build relationships with one another and get to know each other on a personal level so that they could actually m more easily collaborate with each other when we're not there together. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a kind of a cultural ritual that we started doing. 
Um, we also started doing at All Hands a little thing called Iggy's and Wiggy's, which are awards. Um, it's an idea that Erica came up with. And uh, what Iggy's are, because Ig, I-G-G is kind of shorthand for Indiegogo, is, um, and we still do it today, where everyone gets four slips of paper, one with the word, you know, one of the values on the back of each paper. And on the other side of the paper, the, every quarter you write someone's name on it and what they did to exhibit that value. And then we aggregate all those little slips of paper and we give it to everybody so that everybody knows how everyone around them is, appreciates how, how much they're um, embodying our values every day. Um, and then we review people for it. So when we, we're starting to do performance reviews now and, and, and so that we use that as, a very, as an empowerment tool, not a, necessarily a, um, a uh, performance tool, but really a way to kind of make sure people know what they're doing really well and what areas that they need to work on. Uh, we also review people based on, on their values. So it's kind of eked into like all different kinds of um, areas of the company. Um, but what's really shocking, um, oh, and the other thing is we measure it. So um, we also believe that whatever you try to do, you've got to know your results and, and, and how you're performing against it. So we actually now do an employee MPS survey. Um, every month, you're prompted automatically in our system uh, to fill it out. So we actually measure how willing people are to want to um, in, invite their friends to come work for Indiegogo or not. And we look at the results, and we measure it. And we, we try to hold ourselves accountable, because we know that when people feel aligned and feel like their behaviors and their values match where the company is, um, they're set up for success and they want to be there. And when you want to be there, you're more productive. When you're more productive, you're more happy. And it's just this awesome upward cycle. So, um, so that's how we kind of bumped into culture. But the biggest surprise for me, which is learning that I've had in the last couple of years, is that um, the importance of uh, focusing on culture and what your values are ex actually extends beyond the walls of your company. And so, um, the first thing is that it actually it, it extends beyond the people of your company. What became clear is we set our whole strategy and our whole product strategy and, and um, um, how we were attacking crowdfunding completely based on our values. So one thing that makes Indiegogo different, it was, was true about us when we started when we were the only platform and it continues to be true about us today and why people still use us, is that Indiegogo is completely open. We don't have a curation model. We don't have applications. We don't decide who gets to use Indiegogo and who doesn't. Uh, we wanted to take the YouTube approach where everyone has equal opportunity, um, but ideas thrive and rise to the top based on your own hard work and, and hustle and how much your audience wants it and nothing else. No one gatekeeper or one individual has the power to decide the fate of your idea. And that came from our values. Um, that came from us believing in empowerment. That came from us believing in fearlessness and that we needed to change this industry. And the last thing that we wanted to do was become, become the man, <laughs> essentially, like become another gatekeeper. So that's why our product, that's why Indiegogo is an open platform. Um, and our values have actually now surprised me yet again in that, um, and this was the biggest surprise, is that our values haven't just informed what people we hire, nor our product strategy and our vision, but it's actually in, in influenced who our customers are which is an even shocker, shocker thing. So um, when I look at our customers, this is um, a young man who, um, I don't know, maybe some of you might have remembered this a year or two ago. Uh, there was a woman who was bullied on a bus, and her name was Karen Klein. And a young child caught it on video and put it out there. And the video went viral. And this young man um, didn't know the woman but saw her and just felt that this was horrible and wanted to do something about it. And so he found Indiegogo, and that day created a campaign to raise $5,000 to send her on vacation, um, which I thought was really sweet, uh, since we're talking about love, Valentine's Day. Um, but lo and behold, a few weeks later, he's surpassing $700,000. 60 countries funding from all across the world. Um, people just completely um, frustrated and, and shocked by what had happened in America all putting money in um, to say that bullying's not OK. And so yes, this woman went on a nice vacation. She actually got a new carpet as well. So that was an added bonus. Um, and she ended up giving a lot of money back to anti-bullying foundations and causes like that. But what this shows is that our customers, the more our customers exhibit face, um, which in this case, he uh, was incredibly fearless. He saw something that was wrong, and he wanted to make it right. And so he created a campaign on the spot and put himself out there, not having any clue if he was going to be able to succeed or not. He was fearless and just went for it. 
he was authentic and that he just truly believed that this was a, a problem and he, he wanted to do something about it. So he listened to his gut, he didn't overthink it, and he just did what felt right. And he was collaborative in that he reached out to the world <laughs> and said, let's do this together. Um, and he was empowering because what he did is he actually gave the world the ability to, to do something about a problem that also bothered them. Um, so the more our customers exhibit face, the more successful they are. And the more successful they are, the more successful Indiegogo is. And it's this incredible upward spiral. So what I'm saying here is actually if you, if you focus on culture, you're not, if you focus on really understanding the values, beliefs, and behaviors that um, will set your company up to succeed and to thrive, um, you'll do more than just hire the right people. You actually might start affecting um, more people than you ever could, thought, could have thought. And for us, it was outside our walls, it was our customers, and um, I would argue even industry. So um, remember when I was talking about how a lot of businesses kind of operate from a market share mentality where if I win, you lose. It's very zero-sum game mentality. It's very true, it's, very, it's the culture of a lot of business today. Um, well, Indiegogo's mindset is a little bit different. We actually don't, um, don't look at the world in a finite, finite way. We look at the world in an infinite type of way. We, we focus on empowerment, not winning per se, but empowering as many people as possible. In the venture capital world, there's only so much money that can be deployed. And so that means only certain people will get it and other people won't. And on Indiegogo, there isn't that limitation. The more people raise money over here does not mean the less people re raise money over here. Everybody wins. And so um, one of the things that kind of shows that the most is that um, um, our worldview might be catching on and um, proving that maybe that worldview of a zero-sum game isn't necessarily the best worldview for our society and the culture at large. Um, an example of this is uh, in venture capital, we all know this terrible stat. That's why we're all here and I love it. Um, only three to six percent of venture-backed companies have a woman on their team. I know you guys are all changing that soon, so good job. Um, keep doing it. Um, but on Indiegogo, 47% of all successful campaigns are run by women. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm particularly, I'm particularly proud of that stat because what it shows is when you take a world empowerment position, when you create a, a, a level playing field where everyone can succeed and where people succeed on their own merit, not based on what someone's opinion of their potential is, but actually based on their actions, um, everyone, everyone thrives. Women do just as well as men. And all that stuff around women aren't entrepreneurs, it becomes a complete um, bunch of nonsense because the data is showing otherwise. So, what I would like to say, and this is maybe a bit argument or controversial, is that I actually think Indiegogo's um, uh, belief and our value of world empowerment might actually dominate the worldview of world domination. And if we can do that, our culture will have done incredible amounts of work, and I'll be very proud, and I think that's why we're all here today, because we're here to share, and we're here to empower each other, and I think the more success of us, have, us that we have in this room, the more the culture of business will shift. So I'm excited to meet you all, and good luck creating culture. Um, oops. Last, last thing, uh, my team would kill me if I forget to say this. So one of the things is we are doing a big effort around International Women's Day, the whole week leading up to March 8th, we're doing all these kinds of things. So if you have, if you're an entrepreneur that was maybe thinking about uh, running an Indiegogo campaign, or if you know of an organization um, that wants money or needs money, um, all you need to do is be, it has to be related to women in any kind of way. So if you're interested, just email us at womenrock at indiegogo.com and we'll send you all the good stuff. And thank you. Woo! Okay. What? Stay. Okay. Yay! Oh my God, so awesome. Do we get, we have time for one or two questions from the audience? Really? Right here. Thank you. Um, my name is Stephanie. I don't really have a question, but I wanted to thank you for what you just presented. I've been working in very different cultures, very male dominated, dominated by margin, dominated by financial results. Mm -hmm. And it's been frustrating, and people thought that was bold. You've got to be bold, and if you're bold, and if you do tough decisions, that's when you're going to succeed. And mm -hmm. I think it's super bold what you do. I'm really thankful because you're successful with what you do. 
and you prove investors and successful people that there is a different way to do that. And I really believe in that. I think that's the only way to really sustainably establish businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time to make the change. And thank you thank for you. doing that. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I learned at Haas, and I was really into social entrepreneurship, and I do believe Indiegogo is a social enterprise, because, but what, what I learned was um, the, uh, it was a really important kind of insight that I took from, from business school. And that was to truly um, make a successful business, that business needs to be truly meaningful. And the more um, meaningful a company is, the more financially successful it'll be. So what we did is we've, I've been very cognizant and intentional about building our social impact, which is equal opportunity, empowerment, into the business model that we do. So that the more money we make, the more empowerment and impact we have. And the more impact we have, the more money we make. So we don't have to make this trade-off. Uh, between between the two, and I do think that those types of business models are the are the models that are going to be do actually the best. And one of the things I was we just raised um, a Series B financing of forty million dollars. Boom. And because yeah. um, we do believe crowdfunding and venture they work side by side. Indiegogo is creating this incubation platform for ideas to rise to the top in a merit-based fashion, where then venture capital can come in, discover, and amplify further. Mm -hmm. It means their role as gatekeepers changed from no men or no women to yes men and yes women, which is a good thing. And so that's why venture, the venture world is starting to finally fall in love with us. Funny how I can always bring up love. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, so, but, but the point of me saying that is uh, one of the investors that came on board is John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I personally got so excited about having him on board is uh, before he invested in us, he turned to us, he turned to Slav, actually, my co-founder, and said, you know, regardless of whether or not we um, invest in you guys, you should know that you've built a really important company for the world. Mm -hmm. And so important, not necessarily, important leads to big, leads to the financial results. Um, but if it's not important, you can't get there. So that's kind of the, the world view now I look at and like, what are we doing? How important is this really for the world? And if it's important, you've, you, you're on to something, so keep figuring it out. Ah, oh, give me shivers. Okay, we can only take one more question. Oh my God, it's so hard, that hard, that one right there. Hi, um, my name's Susan, and um, I'm just wondering really for people who maybe aren't the founder, co-founder, or CEO, but are mm -hmm. very invested in the organizations they are a part of, that when they see culture has gone off the tracks or mm -hmm. gone wrong in their organization mm -hmm. um, and they want to get it back to where maybe it was when the company was founded and it's gotten mm -hmm. a little bigger, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for those mm -hmm. of us who kind of want to help with that situation but aren't basically the lead in the company mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. can only do so much individually mm -hmm. and how yeah. we pull that back so that the company can get back on the right yeah. track, I guess? Yeah. So, uh, yes, so what I would do is you don't need to be a founder to influence culture. Actually, I heard that one of the biggest drivers of culture at Google was a woman who came in um, like early, early employee under Larry and Sergey, and she's just become this barometer for everything they do people-wise, and it, it just, it, almost she didn't have, any, have an official title of it. But um, what I would do is be proactive about showcasing where is the company out of alignment. Um, so I would definitely take a look at um, Dave Cashin's um, awesome blog, like how to build an awesome culture blog, because um, he actually outlines uh, the fact that a strong culture is, is the way, when it's fully in alignment, the, um, the vision and mission of the company is aligned to the strategic objectives, is aligned to the values, is aligned to the observable behaviors, is aligned to the um, internal operational processes, is aligned to the KPIs and metrics. And when all of that kind of is in alignment, so um, then you've got a, a very clear, um, you've, you've got alignment and everybody knows kind of everything that they're doing is, is serving one, is one consistent purpose. And so what you can do is you can actually show how maybe your, um, your KPIs that you measure every day don't necessarily align to um, the vision and mission of the company. Um, for example, we're here to unleash the independent spirit. That's our vision. And our mission is to democratize finance by empowering everyone across the world to fund what matters to them. Um, for the longest time, our main KPI was, has been funds raised, like how much money are we helping people pull, 
people raise. And what we realize in doing some of this work is that maybe um, there's another KPI that's just as important. That's like the number of people who are actually giving this a try. Like, because sometimes if you fail at raising money, that's a great thing on Indiegogo. You've actually learned fast. You've learned that you have an idea that doesn't really resonate with an audience. So you actually have applied this lean startup methodology. I call it lean funding. And in three weeks, learn that you don't have a product market fit and you need to go back to the drawing board and take two years to figure that out. And so um, because of that, that's very valuable knowledge. And so when people fail, they fail fast on Indiegogo. And it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. And so we want to measure that as well because we're here about kind of unleashing the independent spirit. So what I would do is I would um, take, take all those kind of um, uh, levels and kind of map that out and show where you're in alignment and when you're not in alignment. Um, because, and, and, and extract kind of nuggets or stories where one person was doing this behavior over here because they thought this was important and another person was doing this behavior over here because they thought that was important. And as a, as a result, the project didn't get done. It came in over budget. Um, the results were bad. And essentially the whole point of culture is to, is to, is to set people up for success. And when people are successful, the company's successful, productivity is higher. You can actually use measurements like, like we use employee MPS. Uh, we're starting to measure regrettable loss rate. So this is like employees that leave that were like really pissed off about leaving because they were such a good fit and they had so much potential at our company. Um, we are also measuring, we're gonna start measuring um, culture misfit hire rate, <laughs> which is, um, you know, and the speed to which um, misfits kind of exit the company. If, you know a good strong culture is when when people come in, they're like, ooh, this is not for me, and then they leave really quickly. That's actually okay, because you can't be perfect all the time up front. Um, so there's rates like that, like what's your turnover like? Um, what's, how um, we're gonna be soon implementing an OKR system, um, which is a system to align the goals of the organization with the goals of the groups, which then kind of waterfalls down to the goals of the individual. So everybody who's working on something knows exactly how their impact ma maps to the impact of the whole company's goals. Um, and so you can, you can outline how the, that breaks down. And so I would just show the, the pain, show the mess that's th that are being created because culture's not strong. Um, and then, um, and then try to show that if we get this in alignment, we actually will increase productivity, increase our results. I mean, culture is the foundation you for everything. Like, if you don't have a strong culture, your people like that slide. Like, uh, everyone will be going every which direction, and it'll just it'll be not a surprise that like you missed your quarter numbers or you miss your milestones that you want to do. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers to you. I can't have oh, you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Good luck, everybody.